An Italian student is tortured and murdered in Egypt. Now, Italy is pressing charges as more evidence suggests involvement by Egypt's security services. So will there finally be justice for Giulio Regini? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Imran Khan. It's been nearly five years since the death of Giulio Regini in Egypt. The Italian student was researching labor unions when he disappeared in Cairo. His body was dumped by a road nine days later. Italian investigators say the 28-year-old had been beaten and tortured. New videos obtained by Al Jazeera suggest that security services had followed him for more than a month. Italy accuses Egypt of blocking its investigation. Prosecutors in Rome have now charged four Egyptian agents with kidnapping and murder. Egypt has suspended its own probe, but says whoever killed Regini had no connection with the state. Today we know that the Egyptian general security followed Regini's tracks for 40 days. We know that he was arrested first in a camp, then transferred to cell number 13 of the Egyptian Ministry of Interior. This is a very dangerous matter and the Italian people strongly condemn it. We firmly maintain our position with respect to closing diplomatic ties with Egypt. The lawyer for Regini's family has welcomed the charges as a new chapter in the investigation. Indotto. Giulio Regini was spied on for many weeks, and that was even in his house. The Egyptian National Security Forces entered his room, searched it and took pictures of his passport and followed him everywhere. They were taking pictures of him and creating a spy network that includes his friends. All this can't be done by one individual only, and the responsibility as well can't be placed on one single person. Such a matter undoubtedly would be from the highest authorities. Rights groups are calling for accountability in hundreds of other cases. The Committee for Justice says 1,056 people have been killed in Egyptian detention centres since Abdel Fattah al-Sisi took power in 2013. 731 have died from a lack of health care. 144 were tortured and 67 committed suicide. The Egyptian Commission for Rights and Freedom says that more than 2,700 people have been forcibly disappeared since 2015. Let's bring in our guests. In Geneva, we have Ahmed Mafraid, Director at the Committee for Justice. Dalia Fahmi is the Associate Professor of Political Science at Long Island University. She joins us from New Jersey. And Nabil Mikhail is a political writer and analyst specializing in Egypt. And he joins us from Washington, D.C. A welcome to each of you. I'd like to begin in Geneva with Ahmed Mafraid. The Italians are saying that this is damning evidence, not just of security services involvement, but they're also saying that this shows that there was a conspiracy to try and prove that Giulio Reggiani was actually a part of a spy ring. Do you think there's anything in those charges? Thank you for having me, um, Ron. Um, regarding the transparency, uh, when we're talking about the, the, the transparency on the part of the state, there is no transparency in the part of the state regarding the Regini case or regarding the Egyptian uh, or regarding the violation happening inside detention centers in Egypt. Uh, this is something uh, is clear for us and also is clear for the international community, I think so. Um, when we try to observe about what uh, the situation inside the detention center, we thought that it's, there is no uh, transparency on that. There is a lack of transparency and lying, especially in relation to the human rights situation and detention center. The basis is not transparency. The basis is lying, is uh, the positions of the situations and uh, the Egyptian regime trying to use the propaganda to mislead the public uh, uh, opinion and mislead public society. It's not only mislead, it's not only uh, stopped in, the, uh, in that, but they also try to misleading the, 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 the foreign commission of inquiry, uh, as we all uh, seen 
and the Egyptian authority handling how they are handling uh, uh, of the investigations into the cases of Regini, as, as an example. Uh, it's not only stopped in Regini case, it's also the Egyptian regime tried to uh, mislead the human rights mechanism in the, in, uh, at the United Nations by giving untrue information about many uh, uh, abuses and uh, violation uh, and happening inside detention center in Egypt. We think uh, that without the extent of the independent human rights organization inside uh, and outside Egypt, we will find uh, the Egyptian regime uh, uh, will be, uh, if I can say that, uh, number one in the world who uh, respecting the human rights. On the other hand, what I can... Uh, let me just also... actually, it's an interesting point you make there. Let me just put it to Nabil Mikhail. Uh, Nabil, the Egyptian government have uh, stopped the probe into Regini's death. They've just said, actually, they didn't have anything to do with it. It wasn't the state. However, um, they haven't provided any real evidence there. Our guest in Geneva is basically saying that there's no transparency and there's never been any transparency when it comes to human rights in Egypt. OK, thank you very much for your kind invitation. And... Um, my greetings to the um, distinguished audience and to the honorable guests. Okay, uh, let me put it this way. The question of any human rights activist, whether this kidnapping, disappearance, is exciting and then it fades away a little bit and then later it is revisited. So that cycle has been followed in the case of Regini and others. Uh, whether it could be repeated in the future, it's possible. So it will be an issue. It will be a file. And there are many issues in so many countries whereby the human rights concern was always recycled often and under different circumstances. And as a matter of fact, uh, let me defend the President Trump. President Trump has never been silent on the questions of human rights in Egypt, whether Regini or any other uh, subject. It has always been raised and debated. Um, the other part of the question points to the um, issue of transparency. I mean, welcome to the age of globalization. Everything is open. I mean, uh, it's a throwback to the um, debate or the syndrome of an open society. It is no longer George Orwell's 1984, a totalitarian society hiding the secrets of the states in, quote, a, quote, a ministry of propaganda. So every nation faces a pressure, even the United States, about the transparency of the elections, the transparency of the treatment of inmates or the human rights uh, activists. When it comes to Egypt, yes, uh, Egypt is an open society. It cannot escape the dictates of openness. So any human rights issue will never be hidden from Egypt. As a matter of fact, I recall once an expatriate Egyptian who told me when I was young, a very wise statement. Any rumor in Egypt has its own foundation and grounds because there is some substance to a pep talk about anything. So any human rights concern in Egypt has to be transparent. You cannot hide it. Not just because Egypt has... But surely, 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 Nabil, look, surely, Nabil, if there is no probe, there's no transparency. Dalia Fahmi in New Jersey... Um, the Italian prosecutors have named four people. They are providing evidence, but the Egyptians are, don't seem to be paying attention. What's the, what's the consequences of naming those people? So first, let's look at the evolution of the Egyptian narrative. Um, you know, just last month, the prosecutor in Egypt said that the perpetrator of whatever happened to Regini is unknown. But if you recall, just while Regini's body was being flown back to Italy, the Egyptian government executed four individuals saying that he was killed by a criminal gang. The narrative in Egypt by the regime has evolved over time. And what's happened in the past month is very interesting because the Italian government has actually named four individuals and is looking into the investigation of 12 more individuals that it's asked the Egyptian government for information on that the Egyptian government refuses to release any information. Now, the naming of Tariq Sabr, um, Mohammed Ibrahim, Captain Osman Hilmi, and Majid Ibrahim as Sharif is very interesting because by naming them in public, what's happening is that they are now liable 
and risk detention under Interpol if they are to leave. We used to talk about human rights violations in the names of states and regimes. Now, by targeting individuals at the lower ranks, they can actually be arrested if they attempt to leave the country. Here in the United States, the Global Magnitsky Act that was passed actually allows the U.S. government to sanction individuals and target security officers who have participated and perpetuated and enabled torture to happen to, to activists and, and other individuals, especially those who hold foreign, um, foreign um, passports. Now, just this past summer, the European Union also agreed to establish a similar regime to the Global Magnitsky Act in America, allowing its 27-member bloc to sanction those responsible for human rights abuses. So by the Italian government naming individuals, we've entered into a different moment of accountability on the international world stage, because accountability is not coming from within the investigative bodies of Egypt, and that's become clear over time. Moving from a narrative that he was killed by a criminal gang, that evidence was found with these gang members, and when the evidence was presented to Regini's family, they said that this does not belong to him. And so by creating an international farce over the cover-up of a Cambridge University student whose doctoral dissertation was looking at union activities among street vendors, being seen as a threat is quite telling. Evidence released this week in tapes shows that Regini was followed for over 40 days, that there are tape recordings of individuals in, within the security apparatus who were named talking about what do we do with the so-called young man. We have him. This leads that this was actually state-perpetuated torture leading to the death of a foreign international grad student. The evidence released recently by the Italian but, government. But Dalia, so I have to say, the Egyptian, was... the Egyptian government has actually, it, one of its defences, one of its many defences in this case, is actually, if this will, wasn't a foreign student, you wouldn't care. And now you do, because it's a foreign student. Now, it wasn't nothing to do with us. It was a criminal gang. OK, there's evidence presented, but we've shut down the probe. I mean, there is, there is the Italian government bringing this to the fore. What about all the rest of the people, the Muslim Brotherhood people who've been arrested, people from Hizb Tahrir over the years, any opposition group that have been cracked down on? Why don't those stories get told, Dalia? Why this one? You know, since 2015, there have been almost 3,000 cases in Egypt of forced, enforced disappearances that have led to torture. There are over 60,000 political prisoners. Yes, what is happening in the prison systems in Egypt and throughout the country remains un unknown because Egypt has done several things. It's denied the entry of human rights workers like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. It just imprisoned and released because of international pressure members of a human rights organization. And so what this is indicating, if the Egyptian government can lie on what's happened to an Italian graduate student from Cambridge University, then imagine what happens to the everyday Egyptian. The international community has remained silent on what's happening in Egypt for strategic reasons. For example, the Italian government, even though this is an Italian graduate student, it's evolved even in its relations with Egypt from removing its ambassador to actually becoming a weapons sales um, country that uh, sells weapons to Egypt, a country that's is involved in a um, $1.3 billion oil project with Egypt. And so even the Italian government, just like the French government, just like the United States, hedges its bets on, is it international human rights or is it our strategic interest? But what's happening with the Global Magnitsky Act and the highlighting of cases like Regini and, for example, the incoming Biden administration is that there might be a turning point where the international community Community is forced to look at human rights violations. Well, actually, let's, let's put that this point. Is how That's a very, it's, a, it's a vital point, Dalia. Let's just put that point to Ahmed in Geneva. There's two points I want to put to you. Firstly, our guest in Washington, D.C. said, actually, we don't live in 1984 anymore. There is no police state anymore. Egypt is part of global society, so it, it is transparent just because of the fact we live in the modern world. And secondly, what do you think of this point that the incoming Biden administration, uh, the European Union, etc., might use Regini's case to actually take a look at what's going on inside Egypt? Okay, I, I will begin with the second part. 
And I have a comment regarding the, the, the Regini case. In, in my view, we have now come to the truth of uh, what happened with Regini. And the situation now, it changed. Uh, we are now calling for justice for Regini and for more than 1,000 detainees who have died in Egyptian prisons and detention centers since 2013. Regini was not uh, uh, only victim of Egyptian authorities. Before him came the French uh, citizen Eric Lang, the, the American James Henry uh, Lewin, and after him Mustafa Qasim, if we speak about the foreigner detainees in Egypt. And the others, Egyptian, who uh, were killed in cold uh, blood, and without accountability for their killers and torture so far, uh, we, we, we think we will uh, uh, not going to any justice regarding the uh, deaths in detention centers. We are speaking now about more than 1,000 detainees killed inside Egypt since 2000. And 13. And if this is, uh, uh, and I, I uh, from this, I will answer the first part of your question accountability. Do you think that Egypt government, I, I have this question, do you think that Egypt government uh, uh, accept any investigation regarding 1,000 detainees died inside Egypt detention center except Regini case? Because regime is, is the, the, the investigate from his government. Well, let's, get a, let's, get, a uh, Ahmed, Ahmed, let's get a response from Ahmed. Let's get a let's get a response from Nabil Mikhail. There is no investigation since 2013 until now for 1,000 detainees. Well, let's get a response to your your question, um, Nabil Mikhail. What's your response? Okay, um, look, Egypt can still handle the crisis because. I mean, they have a history of this. I'm old enough to remember the 1970s when um, massive cases of human rights atrocities that were committed uh, after the revolution of July 23rd under the regimes of Nasser uh, were just revealed and announced. So there was an admission of the crimes of the former head of the intelligence apparatus, Salah Nasser, and his associates. And as a matter of fact, just a few days ago, um, Shams Badran, the former war minister, or the guy who hired uh, people who worked for Stalin to torture the Muslim brothers and other inmates, died. And that also revived the whole question about torture and detention in Egypt. Egypt can still manage the crisis. They can, I advise them to have full and candid admission of everything. If he was killed and tortured, just state it publicly and loudly. And then somehow you would be forgiven. But I think Egypt has transformed. Um, you cannot really hide things in Egypt anymore because the regime itself, since the 1970s, has acknowledged the. Okay, Nabil, uh, you, you, have made that, you have made that point, but let me just put something else to you. Okay, so we are in a position where you're suggesting that Egypt is transparent, it should make these admissions. However, it shut down the Regini probe. It always shuts down any probe coming into uh, human rights abuses within Egypt itself. It never really investigates human rights abuses. And there's very few actual convictions. We've got 1,056 people dead since Abdul Fattah al-Sisi took power in Egyptian jails. No one has been held accountable for any of those deaths simply because they're government employees. And if you start charging government employees, you're going to find that you're going to be a very unpopular government. Surely, that's the case. OK, um, this is actually a big question, and it can be debated from different perspectives. Let me just focus on two points quickly. Um, it depends any discussion with the Egyptian government and the Minister of Interior, Wazat al on human rights has to be done through certain organs, through certain institutions. Like, for instance, in the case of the journalists, if some journalists have been abused, the uh, head of the syndicate will talk to the police, will talk to the prime minister, to the president. And usually there is a distancing between the office of the president and um, the human rights abusers. That has been the norm since Sadat, since the 70s, because we, they felt that Nasser was so much involved in observing and knowing about human rights uh, crimes. The second thing is that, like, for instance, if there are problems, say, in the treatment of Christians, the Coptic Church will talk to the foreign, to the prime minister, to the interior minister. So the police will be scrutinized this way. 
So any human rights issue will be debated with, within certain institutions. Whether this is revealed or not is another debate, but you cannot hide it. I'm quite sure that any developments in the case of Regini is still uh, being discussed and debated. There is some discourse going on. I do not know about it, but I will not rule it out. OK, Dahlia Fahmi in New Jersey, um, our guest in D.C. is saying that there are institutions that are ways of dealing with these human rights abuses. They may sometimes come through the church. They may uh, sometimes even go through uh, political organisations. Are there those institutions? No, not that we know of. If we think about what's happened in the past seven years since the military coup of 2013, um, there's upward of 60,000 political prisoners. There have been the torture um, to death of just this year of 140 individuals. Um, over 100, over 1,000 have died in prison um, from torture and neglect. But, and if you look at the cases that are um, used and abused against women and children in Egypt's prisons today, um, Amnesty International released, or, I'm sorry, Human Rights Watch and it released a report saying that there are cycles of hell of what women go through in Egypt's prisons, including gang rape by security officials. Um, what this case is highlighting is, is a regime all the way to the top that is tied to um, that is tied to abuse of individuals. If you look at the case that was filed in American courts June of this year by um, activist Mohammed Sultan against the former Prime Minister Hazem Bablawi, the former Prime Minister um, being accused of actually ordering the torture of of political prisoners, this case highlights that this is these are not independent acts that are going to be dealt with in syndicates or by journalist syndicates, that this goes all the way to the top. And what's become clear in the case of Regini is that the torture was ordered, he was monitored, he was followed. There's a special security apparatus that just monitors foreigners in Egypt. And all of this has been highlighted by this case. And what this is greater reflecting is that if this is how foreigners are treated, Americans, Italians, British stu uh, 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 and, and British students, then imagine what happens to everyday Egyptians that don't have um, voices speaking on their behalf outside because there are no longer any more human rights So, Dali, we are running out of time. We, uh, we are running out of time, and I would like to come to the other guests as well. Ahmed Mafraid, just very quickly, Egypt has institutions that are capable of dealing with this, says our guest in Washington, D.C. Do you agree? I, I don't believe in that. This is not true. This is not true. Uh, if, we, if, we, if we see the situation... Closely, there is no any institution inside Egypt investigate any uh, crimes against uh, human rights or violation happening inside detention centers. I believe that Egypt regime doesn't now care about the human rights situation or any uh, modification of it, but rather misinformation and lying. This is the way that Egypt regime and Egypt institution try uh, used to. Uh, to answer uh, or to, uh, uh, to to speak about or to answer any question regarding human rights uh, uh, violation. What we know is... Sorry, uh, Ahmed, we are, uh, sorry, we are running out of time and I would like to come finally to our guest, Nabil Mikhail. Nabil, after having listened to everything that you've just heard, do you still think there are capable institutions and a decent human rights situation in Egypt? It's not a perfect situation. I would not use the term decent. It's not a perfect one. But again, it is subject to debate. It can improve. And if there is any mistake, it could be highlighted. And eventually you will settle this because on the question of human rights, you have two things. It is selective. And this is applicable in every country, every situation. Second, it can be settled. Like you have South Africa, where a whole population was basically denied basic rights. And then you have the truth commission. So somehow there was a reconciliation. Whether this is uh, this can be found in Egypt depends on the uh, attitudes of the political leadership. But I think they can have this disposition of reconciling to any complaints about human rights violations. I want to thank all our guests, Ahmed Mufray, uh, Dahia Fami and Nabil Mikhail. And I would like to thank you two for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story. From me, Imran Khan, and the whole team here in Doha, bye for now.